a scholar who has taught and lectured at universities around the world and whose writings have been translated into several languages. Dr. Sowell has been a consultant to administrations of both political parties and has served as a scholar in residence at three think tanks. Dr. Sowell has written numerous books on economics, social issues, and public policy. One of his books, A Conflict of Visions, was provided to our seminar attendees to help them understand the underlying assumptions that produce political clashes and that guide the course of history. By the way, Dr. Sowell considers that to be his best book. So uh, seminar attendees, you have his, his greatest uh, work. Most of you here tonight probably know of Dr. Sowell through his syndicated newspaper column, as well as his column published in Forbes magazine, where he is a contributing editor. Dr. Sowell has been described as one of only a handful of thinkers who have the ability to look at the same facts as others, yet conceive webs of explanation that are much more subtle, sophisticated, and accurate than those of his lessers. In describing Dr. Sowell's 1980 book, Knowledge and Decisions, Milton Friedman said it this way, quote, this is a brilliant book. The ideas are original and penetrating, the examples ingenious and apt, the exposition lucid and absorbing. Professor Sowell illuminates how every society operates in the process, he also shows how the performance of our own society can be improved. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce one of America's premier social philosophers and commentators, Dr. Thomas Sowell. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's almost like uh, getting a sneak preview of my obituary. Uh, when, when, I, when I was younger, I, I used to be embarrassed by uh, generous introductions, uh, but then I, I, I realized what the critics were saying, and I, I realized it all evens out in the long run. I'd like to talk about uh, economic decision-making as distinguished from political decision-making. And, and I'd like to start off with a definition of an economy. Uh, an economy is not just a system for producing goods and services and distributing them, because the Garden of Eden was not an economy, since there was no scarcity. So economics is the study of the use of scarce resources, which have alternative uses. So that rationing is inherent in the circumstances. Competition is inherent in the circumstances. There are people, particularly among intellectuals, who think that competition is one of those things we can choose to have or not have when in fact all, the only choice we have is how shall the competition be carried out. The rationing is inherent whether it's under capitalism, socialism, feudalism, or any other kind of method. So that scarcity is the first lesson of economics. Now the first lesson of politics is to forget the first lesson of economics. <laughs> It's, po it's po popular to call, to call politics the art of the possible. I call it the art of the plausible. Because what you're advocating doesn't have to be possible. The Clinton health care program, for example. <laughs> is, uh, 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 Democratic Senator Patrick Moynihan uh, referred to the statistics and the estimates uh, of, of the Clinton of the cost of this program as fantasy but there's no reason why you cannot enact fantasy into law there are many laws which show fantasy has been enacted <laughs> let, let me give you a concrete example of, a, of what an economy involves because an economy involves trade-offs politics involves solutions real or imaginary some years ago, there was a tragic uh, airplane crash in which a baby was killed by being torn from its mother's arms. In Washington, the uh, answer was quite clear. We must have laws that say that babies cannot be held in mother's arms in airplanes. They must have their own separate seat where they're strapped in. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, a couple of economists got hold of this, and they figured out what would be the probable result of such a law. 
Uh, first of all, it means that every couple that's traveling with a baby would have to buy three seats instead of two. And therefore, they would have 50% higher costs of transportation. Now, since to ordinary people in the, in the real world, as it's distinguished from Washington, money matters. And therefore, some of those people would not fly. Some would take alternative transportation on the ground, almost all of which has a higher fatality rate than airplanes. And so they estimated that in the course of a decade, you would save one baby's life and you would lose the lives of 60 other people, as well as $72 million. So the whole perspective of trade-offs is typically lacking in political decision making. People ask such questions as, in politics, uh, is nuclear power safe? And the answer is no, because if nuclear power were safe, it would be the only safe thing on the face of the earth. The only question is, compared to what? <laughs> compared to hydroelectric dams? Compared to doing without electricity? There's a story which I hope is apocryphal of an economist who was on the street, met a, met a friend who said, how are you? How's your wife? To which the economist replied, compared to what? <laughs> so, so looking at nuclear power in this way, it is far safer than any alternative method of producing electricity. Someone calculated how, much, how, how many lives are lost for every so many billion kilowatt hours of electricity because human lives are among the price paid for generating electricity. And having calculated this, they asked how many lives would be lost generating the amount of electricity that would have been generated by Three Mile Island during the time that it was shut down? And the answer was 52 lives. No lives were lost at Three Mile Island, even during the, quote, disaster, unquote. Uh, two people were killed on the highway trying to get away from Three Mile Island. Uh, so someone has calculated the risk to your life of various kinds of activities. Uh, living within five miles of a nuclear power plant for half a century represents the same risk to your life as driving 10 miles on the interstate highway or spending half an hour in a coal mine or six minutes in a canoe. <laughs> and, I, and I think of all the environmentalists in their canoes worrying about <laughs> nuclear power plants. There's a whole uh, literature about safety. I, I think the, the crucial book was uh, Unsafe at Any Speed by Ralph Nader about the Corvair. And the argument was that the, because the Corvair was a rear engine car, it had certain safety problems peculiar to that kind of car, and that these problems were disregarded when the car was produced. And of course, he has all the particular individuals who died as a result of these things. And I took a lot of interest in this since I was driving a Corvair at the time. And it's certainly true that there are different handling characteristics to a rear engine car, which makes it more prone to certain kinds of accidents. But what Nader apparently didn't have time to get around to was that it's less prone to other kinds of accidents. Uh, and therefore, no matter where you put the engine, if you put the engine in the front, if you put it on the top or the bottom or either side, it would have some kinds of accidents that it was more likely to have and other kinds that it's less likely to have. And the studies that have been done indicate the Corvair was no more dangerous on net balance than any other car of that era. There are many other areas where the, the desire for safety, for categorical safety, for solutions, not for trade-offs, um, affect political decision making. For example, pharmaceutical drugs and vaccines very often save many thousands of lives. But sometimes the side effects of the drugs or the diseases you catch from the vaccine itself cause crippling illnesses and sometimes fatal illnesses. 
And of course, if you allow everyone who has suffered these effects to sue the pharmaceutical companies, then of course the pharmaceutical companies have every incentive to cut back on the production of existing drugs and vaccines and to reduce their investment in producing new drugs and new vaccines to solve, to find cures for diseases that are killing people today. I'd like to talk a little bit about the whole political mode of uh, decision making in terms of the patterns that you see in it. Uh, there's one pattern in which you, you, ge you, you generate um, political support by creating a quote crisis unquote. Now since all human situations have some negative features to them, nothing is easier than to find something to complain of and to call it a crisis. Uh, a crisis does not mean that what you're talking about is any worse than anything else that human beings do. It does not even mean that it's getting worse than it was in the past. In a remarkable number of cases that I've looked at, the thing that is called a crisis has in fact been getting better for years prior to the policies. <laughs> now after you've, after you've convinced people there's a crisis, you have your solution. This is sort of a four stage thing. First comes the crisis, then comes the solution. Typically, the people who advocate this solution will say this will lead to beneficial result A. The critics say this will lead to detrimental result Z. Third stage, they put the policy in, and the result is that it leads to detrimental result Z. The interesting part is the fourth step, where the people who attribute this detrimental result to the policy are accused of being simplistic for ignoring the complexities of the many factors involved. Moreover, the only cure for this new bad situation is more of the same policy. Let me give a couple of examples. First, the war on poverty. Now, the purpose of the war on poverty was not to prove that if you took money from here and, get, and put it there, there would be more money there than there was before. The purpose of the war on poverty was to end dependency on government handouts. That is, you would have an increase in spending and investment, as they say, in these programs which will then pay off down the road as all the problems that have been forestalled by this wonderful program now begin to subside. Uh, you can quote either from Lyndon Johnson or Bill Clinton, depending on who you prefer to quote. Large literature from both sources. And so, and retraining is one of the great magic words in both administrations. You will retrain people, including people who were never trained in the first place. <laughs> in order to reduce long-term dependency. So the predictions were made that if you had these programs, after some period of years, dependency on the government would decline. And of course, the opposite uh, pr prediction that dependence on the government would increase. And so the war on poverty was initiated. Uh, dependency uh, increased to, un first of all, the situation at the beginning of the, uh, of the crisis. Poverty had been declining in the United States for at least a decade. Dependency on the government to stay out of poverty had been declining for at least a decade prior to the war on poverty. Dependency on government began to increase almost immediately. As of today, there are more people in poverty than there were in 1964, despite literally trillions of dollars spent. And the only cure is more of the same. Example two, sex education. Now the goal of sex education was to prevent teenage pregnancy and venereal disease. And this was of course a crisis. Now for those of us who are tend towards skepticism, if we look back at the actual data we find, the teenage pregnancy was declining for more than a decade prior to the introduction of sex education into the public school system. Uh, By 1968, half of all the public schools in the United States had sex education. During the 1970s, the other half kicked in. Teenage pregnancy during the decade of the 1970s rose by approximately 50%. Teenage gonorrhea tripled between 1956 and 1978, and both those trends are still continuing. And the fourth stage, the cure for all of this, sex education. 
And now we come to a current example, the health care situation, or the health care crisis, I'm sorry. Now, how do we know that there's a health care crisis in the United States? Because the president has told us again and again. The president's wife has told us. The media have told us. What more could you want? Now, one of the, one of the statistics they throw around is that the United States spends 14% of the GNP on health care. Uh, no reason is given why a higher or lower number would be better. <laughs> Particularly in a country which is growing older and wealthier at the same time. Uh, Germany and Japan are held up as models because there they only spend 9%. I'll get back to Germany and Japan a little later. Uh, one of the confusions is the confusion between health insurance and medical care. And the second confusion is between medical care and health. Uh, we already have virtually universal medical care in the United States. The poorest soul in these United States who passes out on the streets will get medical care. He may or may not pay the hospital, but he will get medical care. The other thing is confusing medical care with health. There are tremendous differences in longevity within the United States. Mormons in the United States have a life expectancy a decade longer than the average white American. Is this because the Mormons have extraordinary medical care? Or could it have something to do with the fact that they don't drink, they don't take drugs, uh, and they don't go around shooting each other? <laughs> now, the favorite um, explanation for any problem in Washington is that our society has failed. And so prenatal care is held up uh, 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 as one of the ways of reducing our infant mortality. One of the faster ways of, introducing it, uh, uh, of reducing our infant mortality would be to collect the statistics the way they do in the countries we're compared to. <laughs> Was it, which is to say that when a very underweight baby is born in the United States, all kinds of medical treatment are given to that baby. And when the baby dies in spite of that treatment, that baby becomes part of our infant mortality statistics. In many other countries, no such effort is made to save that baby. And when that baby dies, that is counted as a stillbirth, not as infant mortality. So it's much faster to reduce infant mortality that way to make ourselves <laughs> comparable to the people we're being compared with. A couple of years ago, there was a study which showed that um, prenatal care was uh, not as common among blacks as among whites, and that there was a higher infant mortality rate among blacks. The immediate conclusion was clearly it was one thing was the cause of the other. Again, being sort of battle-hardened about these things, I sent away for the study. And on the very same page where the statistics showed that blacks had higher infant mortality rates and lower prenatal care. It showed that Mexican Americans have even lower, pre, even less prenatal care than blacks and lower infant mortality rates than whites. And if one were to thumb a few pages on, one would discover that Americans of Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino ancestry likewise had lower infant mortality rates than whites and less prenatal care. The conclusion I would draw is that there is no connection between prenatal care and infant mortality. But of course, that's not a politically popular conclusion. There'll be a lot of bureaucrats out of work if we start thinking that way. Getting back to Germany and Japan. In Germany and Japan, people have more doctor's visits for the same disease and shorter visits each time. So one of the ways in which you can bring healthcare costs under control 
is to have someone go to the doctor 10 times for half as long instead of five times for twice as long. That way your statistics will show that you have brought health care costs under control. Now if you're an elderly person who has to stand out on the street in the winter waiting for a bus 10 times instead of five times, you may not fully appreciate the good that's being done for you. One of the confusions that runs through the whole health care issue is the difference between controlling costs and controlling prices. Let me look at some of the cost differences that exist. Uh, an American doctor pays 14 times as much for malpractice insurance as a doctor in Germany. Nothing that the administration has said is likely to reduce that, that cost. In fact, given the political support of the Trial Lawyers Association for Bill Clinton, I doubt seriously if that cost will be reduced at all. Controlling prices is something very different. Nothing is easier than to control prices. You issue a law saying it is illegal to charge more than X for product A. They've been doing this not only for centuries, but literally for thousands of years. Uh, the Emperor Diocletian, back in the days of the Roman Empire, had price controls. Had exactly the same consequences as price controls under Jimmy Carter. Diocletian's reaction was very similar to Jimmy Carter's. <laughs> he wondered why people were so greedy. <laughs> now, now, one of the reasons the United States has higher costs is that we have better health care. It was fascinating to, to watch the President say that we have the best health care in the world. Yes, the best does cost more. Uh, you, you can always pay less and get less. But only by going through the government are you likely to pay more and get less. <laughs> the United States has the lowest death rate from cancer of the stomach, cervix and uterus of any country in the world. It has the second lowest death rate for breast cancer and from heart attacks. There are more than twice as many CAT scanners per capita in the United States as in Germany. More than three times as much, many as in Canada. What's fascinating in all the discussion of health care is that the entire supply side is ignored. I don't know where these doctors are going to come from that are going to give us this greatly increased medical care that we're demanding uh, at the government's expense. For example, there are something like 8,000 doctors from Canada alone practicing in the United States, partly as a result of the wonderful Canadian health system that we're being asked to imitate. Correspondingly, there are large numbers of Canadian patients who come to the United States as a result of the wonderful health care in Canada that we're being asked to imitate. I was up in Spokane this spring and they mentioned how all the people who come down from Canada to be treated. That is, they, they pay their costs down to the United States in addition to paying for medical care here that they could get free in Canada. One of the people who did this was the Premier of Quebec. I told them in Spokane, just, just wait, wait a while. After a while, we'll have our health care system and Americans will be going up to Canada. <laughs> Over a period of about a dozen years, something like 15,000 doctors came here from India alone. So we have a very large medical contingent in this country from around the world coming here to enjoy the free conditions of the American medical system. Of course, if we make our system just like theirs, many of them will probably decide to go home. What's really lacking in so many areas is, is a lack of knowledge of the role of prices. There's a notion that prices are just things that people set up arbitrarily on their own. I call it volitional pricing. You decide that you want to charge this. Some prices are high because people are greedy, and other prices are low, presumably, because they're not so greedy. Um, when I was teaching at UCLA, I used to tell the people, if, that, if that's true, then it must be that proximity to the, to the ocean increases greed, because all the housing prices near the ocean are far higher than they are inland. <laughs> it's 
is you go east into the smog while the prices go down. And it seemed to me that proves that smog is an antidote to greed. <laughs> Unfortunately, this theory has not yet been recognized. <laughs> There is no sense that prices are conveying some underlying reality. In fact, I have a book coming out this fall which is called, Is Reality Optional? <laughs> and unfortunately, among many intellectuals, the answer will be yes. Now, some years ago when I taught at Brandeis, I, I traveled from California to Massachusetts and discovered that my auto insurance rates had doubled. Uh, and since Los Angeles is not one, a small village or something, you wonder why does that happen? Now at about the same time, many other people were upset because Massachusetts had the highest auto insurance premiums in the country. The political answer was not to say why are these premiums so high, what, 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 what fact are they conveying, but it was to control the premiums. In fact, they launched an investigation of the insurance industry the net result of which was they discovered that insurance companies were losing money in Massachusetts, charging the highest auto insurance premiums in the country. Now, anyone who's ever seen Massachusetts drivers will know that there's no mystery as to why those premiums are so high. <laughs> the only place where you can regularly see drivers changing lanes in the tunnel during the rush hour <laughs> is in the Callahan Tunnel in Boston. When I taught at Brandeis, I can recall driving to work on the right-hand side of the street and being surprised to see a tractor trailer pass me on the right, on the shoulder of the road. <laughs> the only place where I've seen uh, emergency vehicles with their sirens on, having to jam on the brakes because someone did a left turn in front of them, is in Massachusetts. But of course, people didn't want to hear what the prices were telling them, and so the answer was to control uh, the prices themselves. There have been many uh, other areas in which there have been price controls. They have a standard, really stereotypical pattern. One is that you reduce the supply of whatever is being controlled. Not surprising since people do less when they're paid less. The other uh, is that you reduce the quality of what's being controlled, because higher quality is costlier than lower quality. And when you, control, when you force the prices down, people then reduce the quality of, of what they're producing. One of the classic examples is housing. Uh, wherever rent control has been put in, there is a, a shortage of apartments. In many places, th there's a provision in the law that says this is only a temporary measure uh, until the housing shortage is over. And sometimes they define that in terms of some percentage of vacancy and so on. Uh, and what they don't understand is that as long as that law is on the books, there will always be a shortage, and there will never be a time to take the law off the books. In Paris, they put a law like this on the books as an emergency measure during World War I. It was still in force when World War II broke out. In Sweden, they put one in in the early days of World War II. Decades later, it was still there. Finally, for some reason, it occurred to someone to take off the price controls. Instantly, there was a housing surplus. The housing projects put up by the Swedish government suddenly began to have high vacancy rates. And in fact, had to be bailed out because they couldn't fill them. I thought about rent control a few years ago when I visited uh, West Berlin. It was, it was still a difference in those days. And I could see this marvelous new uh, modern city. And I came back and visited some of my relatives in the, in, in the Bronx. And as I drove uh, into the Bronx and I saw all these hulks of abandoned and boarded up buildings, I thought, suppose someone from Mars had come down here and you said to him, which of these two cities was bombed during World War II? He would pick the Bronx. Because Berlin had recovered from the bombing, but the Bronx had not recovered from rent control. One of the other problems of uh, politics is that there must always be problems and solutions. It was once said of a liberal politician, he has more solutions than there are problems. Let me give you an example of how problems can be created 
statistically and otherwise. One of the, uh, the Congressional Budget Office came out with some statistics a few years ago showing that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer or were during the Reagan administration, presumably not in this new enlightened era. Now, what, what, uh, again, being skeptical, I sent away for the original uh, statistics. It, it really produces absolute cynicism when you read enough of these uh, government reports. Uh, one of the ways that the poor were getting poorer was that they left out of the these statistics, more than $150 billion in government transfers. Uh, those weren't counted. And as for the rich, they counted as capital gains things that most people would not think of as capital gains. For example, if you invest $10,000 and you hold the investment while the price level doubles, uh, and then you cash it in. Now, if you get less than $20,000, you have lost money in real terms. Not as far as the government's concerned. Let's suppose you get 15000 back with the price level doubled. As far as the Congressional Budget Office is concerned, you've made $5,000 in capital gains. And if, and if you want, want to correct for inflation, you divide the $5,000 by two, and so you've made $2,500 in capital gains. So you can be one of the rich who's getting richer all the while you're heading toward bankruptcy court. <laughs> and this, this, this produced what I think is one of the fundamental principles of statistics, which is that A always exceeds B if you leave out enough of A and exaggerate B. <laughs> one, of, one, of, one of the reasons that the uh, people in the upper income bracket receive such a high percentage of the total national income is that there are more people. That is, if you took a look at the top 20% of families and income and look at the bottom 20%, you'll discover that there are 28% more people at the top, in the top 20% than in the bottom 20%. And since it is people who earn money, this is one of the reasons the others are in the top brackets. There have been a number of studies done. Well, there's, there's a more fundamental problem with the data than this. Years ago, someone uh, uh, told about a, uh, a man in New York who had heard that someone was hit by a car in Manhattan once every 20 minutes. And his response was, he must get awfully tired of that. <laughs> exactly the same reasoning can be found in these statistics that are given out, because they assume that these are the same people all the time. Uh, there have been several studies done, and fortunately, they've been done by people who are left-wing intellectuals at the University of Michigan and conservative Republicans in Washington, and they all give the same answer, which is that in the course of less than a decade, most Americans move out of whatever income bracket they're in. For example, if you looked at the um, bottom 20% as of 1979 of income taxpayers, by 1988, 85% of those people were no longer at the bottom. In fact, a slightly higher percentage were in the top 20% by 1988 than remained in the bottom 20%. And so we're talking about a changing mixture of people over time rather than the same folks. In fact, many of the people in the bottom 20% are the children of the people in the top 20%. <laughs> and finally, let, let me look at another uh, crisis that we hear of, uh, hunger statistics. Now, a political advocacy group computed a few years ago how many Americans were hungry. Now, when you think about it, how would you find out how many people are hungry? It takes a long time to go through a country of 240 million people and ask everybody, are you hungry? <laughs> Naturally, they had to speed this up. So they got a census computer tape and they figured out the eligibility for food stamps, and they ran the tape through to find out how many people are eligible for food stamps. Then they found out how many people actually get food stamps. They subtracted one from the other, and the difference were hungry. <laughs> Using this method, someone decided to find out what was the hungriest county in the United States. <laughs> it turned out to be a farming and ranching community. 
where the employees and the employers ate what they grew. <laughs> now, because the employees were being paid partly in room and board, their cash payments were lower than they would have been otherwise. And so in the county, there were a certain number of people who were uh, below the level where they were eligible for food, even though they were eating their own steaks and, and vegetables. And only, I, think, I think there was only one person in the entire county who actually was on food stamps. All the others were hungry. <laughs> there, there are more of these things, but I, I'm going to cut, cut it short to have some time for questions and answers. Uh, one of the, with hunger as with income, when you look at actual individual flesh and blood people, you get a radically different answer than if you look at the, st at the gross statistics. So the Center for Disease Control uh, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture have actually looked at flesh and blood people. They have taken blood samples. They've done other studies of them. They cannot find any greater likelihood of poor children being clinically underweight than other children. Blood samples show no evidence of any protein or vitamin deficiencies varying from one income bracket to another. The only difference they can find is that low-income women have a slightly greater tendency to be obese, presumably from hunger. <laughs> the, the, the media play a tremendous role in all this. Because you can always find someone who is highly atypical, put him on the tube, interview him, and represent his case as if it's typical of the whole country. And there's a great deal of that going on. There are not only ideological reasons for doing this, there are financial reasons. Because obviously the more crises there are, the more reason there is to buy newspapers and watch television. And so you find many, many crises in these places. Now, I've suggested a couple of times and like most suggestions by economists, it was ignored, that uh, the networks could easily afford to have a department of st professional statisticians who would examine all these hysterical statistics that are thrown around by various groups that would have uh, an ax to grind. Of course, that would mean there'd be more accuracy on, 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 the, on the television tube, but it also means there'd be lower ratings. And so this is apparently not the kind of trade-off that they're looking for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We have a couple of uh, cordless microphones that we're, we'll be circulating around. Uh, if any of you would like to ask Dr. Sowell a question, please raise your hand and we'll try to get a mic, mic for, to you. Please speak into the mic so we can all hear. I'd be interested in your opinion on Rush Limbaugh. I'm a Rush Limbaugh fan. I was uh, uh, delighted to, to hear that my friend Walter Williams was substituted for Rush recently. I didn't hear the broadcast, but I'm going to send away for the tape. Uh, I assume that they put on Walter for, for those who thought that Rush was too moderate. <laughs> no, it's, it's incredible, uh, the, the demonization of this man in the media. Uh, it's, uh, how many of you knew, know that the largest, the biggest bestseller in history of any nonfiction book was written by Rush Limbaugh? <laughs> this book was on the New York Times bestseller list for dozens of weeks before the New York Times ever reviewed it. <laughs> 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 and the review was buried in the back of the, of, 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 of the section. 
One of the really scary things is the extent to which people are being demonized for, for political differences. Uh, I think the prime example is uh, Clarence Thomas. Uh, it's, it's simply not enough for people to say they disagree with his political opinions or with his judicial philosophy. They must picture this man as a demon. Now, I've known Clarence Thomas since 1979, one of the hardest people in the world to demonize. Uh, I, 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 I get worked up when I go into when I even talk, think about it. Um, I hope everyone has read David Brock's book called The Real Anita Hill. The, uh, the, the gist of it is that before this book was written, uh, it was her word against his. But after this book was written, it's her word against a whole army of people who contradict what she said subject after subject after subject. Um, one of, one of the fascinating things which seemed to me so uh, characteristic of Clarence was that during this early period when he was at the uh, at Department of Education, uh, he would drop Anita Hill off when he was passing her place. And one evening she invites him in, and this is from people who were there who knew both of them at the same time, to whom she complained that he paid no attention to her. Very different from her later complaints. <laughs> and one of the stories that uh, she told to the, her fellow employees was that she invited him in uh, offered him a glass of wine, which he declined, and that he sat there talking about Ronald Reagan and his grandfather, which again sounds very typical, but somewhat different from the story that's being told in the, in the, in the media. In any event, I got off on the, onto a tangent. <laughs> uh, first of all, congratulations on your book, Exposing the American Education System. Uh, my question is education related. How do you respond to the anti-choice and anti-voucher educators who say that the American education system has been the great equalizer in our democracy and to allow vouchers to be used in private schools would destroy the great equalizer? It's, fa it's fascinating because uh, what, what they're saying is that if everyone has an opportunity to go to private schools, that's unequal. But if only those with their own money have to have that right, then it's equal. It's, it's fascinating reasoning. Uh, <laughs> no, they're, they're having a, com a, a tremendous uh, a campaign in California to say how horrible the voucher schools will be, how wonderful the public schools are. And, and what's, what strikes me is that even if you were to grant that for the sake of argument, uh, why then would you expect parents to be leaving these wonderful public schools to go to these horrible voucher schools? Uh, uh, Unfortunately, I think they have a chance of winning out there, that is the, uh, the public school people, uh, partly because it's an off-year election. Uh, and so many, many of the voters will simply not turn out. Well, every member of the National Education Association will certainly turn out and vote at least once. <laughs> Dr. Sowell, Dr. Sowell, I am chairman of Florida's Republican Party, and I have used such a dis, uh, disregard is here. <laughs> I have used your conflict of visions as, a, as an analysis between the difference in the Florida uh, Democrat and Republican Party. And I'm never sure I have quite captured that. Your, your book was so intellectually challenging that it left me kind of in the doldrums from time to time. Would you address that for me in a way that I might read uh, Represent that in a way that might be more fashionable than I have done so already. Well, since I know absolutely nothing about the Florida parties, parties of the Democrats or the Republicans, I'm not sure how I could do that. <laughs> but well, uh, yeah. Uh, well, one of the things that happens is people, uh, some, some gatherings, they introduce me and say how, how I came out of Harlem and went on to professional career as if that was something extraordinary. And a few years ago, uh, a black lawyer in Harlem wrote to me, from Harlem, I don't think he was in Harlem anymore, uh, saying that uh, he grew up in Harlem and uh, gave the address, it was about two blocks from where I grew up, saying, you know, really, that was not that unusual in that era. And he proceeded to list the uh, 
I think it was something like a, a, a priest, uh, two lawyers, a college president, etc., who all came out of this one building, this one tenement that he lived in. And as I thought back over it, uh, I, I realized that was really not that unusual in that era. That uh, I lived uh, within a oh within about a five block radius of 145th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue in Harlem. And within that radius, I can remember a kid whom I played with who went on to become the dean of one of the colleges, has recently retired. Another, a half a block away, who recently retired as a psychiatrist. I'm the only one who's still working from this cohort. <laughs> uh, uh, half a block away also lived Harry Belafonte. And five blocks the other direction was James Baldwin. And uh, again, within the same radius at the same time, uh, Colin Powell went to college there. So it was not at all that unusual in that time. Part of the reason was that people were able to get a decent education in the school system, which they cannot get today in that same place. Uh, I, I went, um, I had my niece who lives in Harlem tell me the name of the math textbook that her kids were using in the 11th grade. I got myself a copy to see what they were doing. And the next time I talked with her, I said, you know, what they're teaching your kids in the 11th grade is what they taught me in the 9th grade. So that's where the educational system is. So that a kid who lives in that same block that I or that lawyer lived in no longer has the same opportunity that we had because the education system has been destroyed. There's a great deal of uh, self-congratulation in some liberal circles because of all the things that have been done for blacks. But if you destroy the family, law and order, and education, there is nothing else you can do that will make up for it. talking with you sometime and drop me a line for Hooper Institute. I must say he sounded like his old self after he gave that speech to, to the Senate, uh, the denouncing him at, at, at the end. I talked I talk to him the next I talked with Clarence Thomas the morning after, the morning after he gave that speech uh, on television denouncing the senators, and he, uh, he sounded wonderful. <laughs> he was himself for the first time in a very long while, having gotten all that off his chest. Did you go through the stage of experience that many bright young men go through of beginning as a young college student, as a liberal in your economics, an interventionist, a socialist, and move toward the free market? Or did you, were you born understanding the free market? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I don't do things by half. I was a Marxist. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's no point messing around. <laughs> And uh, many people say, th th uh, have told me that they, they think I must have changed when I went to the University of Chicago and studied under Milton Friedman. It was not true. After I spent a year in Chicago, had taken Milton Friedman's course and even more miraculously passed it. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, my views were unchanged. What changed me was getting a summer job in the government and seeing how the government actually operates. <laughs> I haven't followed that controversy. Uh, in general, I tend to wonder what purpose it serves. Um, 
The Federal Reserve System, like so many things, was an outgrowth of a, quote, crisis, unquote. Uh, there had been some uh, banking problems and some uh, contraction of the money supply. And so the Federal Reserve System was imposed to stop that. Now, it so happens that the largest contraction of the money supply ever in the entire history of the United States occurred after the Federal Reserve System was put into place. Uh, from 1929 to 1932, there had never been anything that bad before. So I'm not at all sure why we have a Federal Reserve System, except that we've had one, and that there are four people who don't want us to get rid of it, because it would mean their jobs. Can I take one more question? One more? Okay. Was there someone over here? No. Yes. Um, I, I just had a question about sexual harassment, and it relates to a uh, seminar I had at work where I was told because of the development of sexual harassment laws that if I were to see a single man who worked for my company out of work who was dating a single woman and I knew that it was completely consensual, I would have to report that to the re human resources representative. The reason being is because there's been court cases where if the company doesn't know and three years later they can be sued, the companies end up liable. And from my, my point, when I look at that, I think of what Russians was like. In Russia they used to tell the kids to report on the parents. And I don't know, some about that seems Orwellian to me. Yeah. And I'd like to know what your insight as to where we're going with that is. Where's it going to end? I hadn't heard of that particular one. It sounds like do ask and do tell. <laughs> uh, I think I'll stop on that note. <laughs> I should feel perfectly safe, Doctor, in saying you made 580 new friends here tonight, really. We do thank you for bringing your insights to us tonight. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. And this, this uh, concludes our program tonight. Have a safe trip home. Good night. The Institution for World Capitalism is an independent nonprofit organization on the campus of Jacksonville University in Florida. The institution was founded to advance the principles of democratic capitalism in America and around the world. We do this through a program of education and public affairs, including presentations such as the one you have just seen. The institution promotes a greater understanding of the three interrelated systems of democratic capitalism an economic system based on private enterprise, a political system based on constitutional democracy, and a moral cultural system based on individual liberty. We encourage you to help us spread the message of democratic capitalism, a message that freedom and capitalism remain the best way for the world and for our own nation to build a better future. To contact the institution, write to Institution for World Capitalism, Jacksonville University, 2800 University Boulevard North, Jacksonville, Florida, 32211, or call us at area code 904-744-9986. I'm David Bussey. Thank you for watching.